Good evening, folks, and welcome to our premiere episode of GCTV Public Access. I am your host and the theater manager of the Garfield Center for the Arts, Nick Carter. Um, uh, uh, however, I will not be your host this evening, but we'll get to that in a minute. Um, as always, I would like to ask you if you uh, enjoy what you're seeing here tonight or enjoy what you've seen other nights, we ask that you please consider donating to the Garfield Center for the Arts uh, or purchasing a gift certificate from garfieldcenter.org slash donate slash. Um, I still haven't learned whether or not that second slash is important, but it's there, so I'm going to keep on saying it. So tonight, public access. Uh, we got some, some, friends from, uh, some friends from in town, some new people from around the area and points further. Um, but uh, that's all I have to say. I'm actually going to turn tonight over to um, our executive director, Steve Arnold, uh, recorded previously this week. Uh, so enjoy it, and I'll see you afterwards. Hi, my name is Steve Arnold. I'm the executive director of the Garfield Center for the Arts. And I'm also going to be acting as a host for this evening's public access performance here on GCTV. So we have assembled a really great uh, set of videos from uh, different performers who have submitted for this presentation. So you're gonna see a lot of really fun stuff, uh, things I know that you're gonna enjoy. We are going to kick things off, though, with someone that you are probably already very familiar with. She is a local Chestertown resident, a very well-loved performer and resident of the area. Shannon Whitaker uh, performed a couple of shows for me years and years ago that I directed when I was in the area the first time. Uh, and uh, I am always astounded and amazed at the incredible quality of her singing talent and her performance capabilities. So please welcome her. She's singing Part of Your World from The Little Mermaid. So here I present Shannon Whitaker. Ask 
ask them my questions and get some answers. What's a fire and why does it, what's the word? Burn, when's it my turn? Wouldn't I love, love to explore the shore of above? Out of the sea, wish I could be. Part of your world. Next up is a 24 year old stand up comedian from Chicago, Illinois. Now she happens to be quarantining just across the bay in Maple Lawn, Maryland, and somewhere saw the posting that we sent out for our public access presentation, and she submitted a proposal right away. Her name is Raya Marchetti. I'm sure that the, um, the process of performing for a uh, webcam or a video camera is very different than what she normally experiences as a comedian. But I know that uh, though she won't be able to hear your laughter, I'm sure she'll be able to feel it. So uh, enjoy and laugh along with this presentation from stand-up comedian Ryan Marchetti. My name again is Ryan, which is not a typical girl name. Like you see the name Ryan, you're kind of expecting a boy usually probably. Um, so when I was in second grade, I moved halfway through the year and I think my class was like really excited to like welcome me into the class and they decorated my desk but they drew like soccer balls and footballs on blue construction paper and I was like oh when they saw my name was Ryan they thought I was gonna be athletic which I'm not, so huge disappointment there. <laughs> uh, I'm quarantining with my entire family and my sisters love Star Wars. And I'm sorry, but I don't like Star Wars. I'll say it and I know you guys are gonna hate me, but I don't like it. I, you know, it's just not for me, but I figured, you know, after my sisters finished, you know, the original 97 movies or however many there are, maybe then we could watch Freaky Friday or like whatever I wanted to watch. But apparently Star Wars never ends. There's a show and a cartoon and a million spin-offs. Like if you're a character in Star Wars, you're going to have a spin-off show for sure. There's no doubt that you will have a spinoff show. I saw, <laughs> I saw a spinoff show and it was, the main character was a friend of a friend of Han Solo. <laughs> That's not a show. That is not, I'm sorry, but that should not be a show. It's, it's, it's crazy. I, I was appalled. I was appalled at that. And I'll never get to watch whatever I wanna watch. Um, I'm actually filming this in my sister's playroom and I was walking around here earlier and I saw this toy and I was like, oh my god, I remember this toy. It's a sticky hand on a string and you throw it at the wall and it's amazing, it's sticking! And then it kind of starts to peel off the wall and then it falls on the ground and it's dirty and dusty and has pieces of hair on it and you kind of just regret ever throwing it in the first place. And I was like, that is a metaphor for my dating life. Like it's amazing. And then I kind of regret having ever done it in the first place. And that's not a good mindset to have with, when dating, if you guys didn't know that. Um, I'm terrible in a relationship. If you, you know what? If you guys have ever seen the Titanic, the movie where they're like about to drown or something, and Leonardo DiCaprio, like I'm, I'm Leonardo DiCaprio, like there's room for me on the raft, but I'd rather die than have a conversation with my partner. <laughs> like, that's me. And that's, that's like so terrible. I, 
it's crazy. Um, but I, I also, I watched The Bachelor and I realized that I don't want to date beautiful people. Isn't that that's like a crazy thing to say? I don't want to date beautiful people. But I don't, I, because I don't want to fall in love in a helicopter. I don't want to do that. And everybody on The Bachelor, they go in a helicopter and they fall in love. And I, I have a fear of heights. So I'm going to stick with, you know, dating the average looking people on the ground. Thank you very much. You know, like I think average people on the ground over beautiful people in the sky any day, you know, and I'm on the dating. I'm on all those dating apps and I just wish there was a filter where I could say, I don't want to see the ugly people. I don't want to see the beautiful people. I just want to see someone who can wear a button down and look okay. You know, wear a button down and look fine. You know, like, that's all I need. That's all I want. Somebody make, if you're an app developer, I would love for you to make that for me. <laughs> um, my, so my parents got divorced a long time ago and my mom got remarried. She married my stepdad. His name is Mr. Steven. That's what I call him anyway. Um, but at first I was like, I don't like this situation. I don't think I approve of this because I had listened to Cher's song, Believe, where she's like, do you believe in a life after love? And then she says, no. So I kind of like, I kind of thought it was like illegal to date after divorce. If you're listening to that song, so it's like, I don't approve of my mom dating this man. And I, I kind of became a huge pain in the butt. Like I canceled all my outdoor activities for like two years. And I dedicated all of my time to making sure that they never got the opportunity to kiss. <laughs> That's how much of a bane in the butt I was. My stepdad proposed to my mom in Paris. So romantic. He proposed to her in Paris because that was the only place he could do it and make sure that I wouldn't be there. I was a menace. I was a menace. So when the wedding came around and you know, the minister was like, you make us the bride. I was like, uh, I'm not gonna watch this. So I left, I walked out of the church and I was the maid of honor. So that was like visible. But that's, <laughs> that is why I don't think you should make your maid of honor a nine year old. Like my mom's bachelorette party was at the Rainforest Cafe. <laughs> like, and her, her something borrowed from me was my American Girl doll. And I was like, I'm gonna need that back by tomorrow for playtime. <laughs> like, that's so insane. Anyway, well, that's all for me. I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you and your families are staying safe and healthy. Thank you guys. You're certainly gonna recognize the next one. Uh, this is uh, someone who actually even opened our program this evening. And that is our good friend, Nick Carter. Nick is lighting designer extraordinaire and of course our wonderful theater manager, but he's also a really fantastic performer. Now twice so far in the history of GCTV, we've had a chance to see him uh, be able to perform two different poems from his favorite poet, Robert W. Service. So the first two that he did, the uh, first one was the Cremation of Sam McGee, and the other one was the Ballad of Blasphemous Bill McGee. Those titles are a mouthful. Um, but this third one that he's going to uh, perform for you here now is called The Shooting of Dan McGrew. So welcome back to our program, our good friend Nick Carter. A bunch of the boys were whooping it up in the Malamute Saloon. The kid that handles the music box was hitting a ragtime tune. Back of the bar in a solo game sat dangerous Dan McGrew, and watching his luck was his light of love, the lady that's known as Lou. When out of the night, which was 50 below, and into the din and the glare, there stumbled a miner, fresh from the creeks, dog dirty and loaded for bear. He looked like a man with a foot in the grave and scarcely the strength of a louse, Yet he tilted a poke of dust on the bar, and he called for drinks for the house. There was none could place the stranger's face, though we searched ourselves for a clue. But we drank his health, and the last to drink was dangerous Dan McGrew. There's men that somehow just grip your eyes and hold them hard like a spell. And such was he, and he looked to me like a man who had lived in hell. 
with a face most hair and the dreary stare of a dog whose day is done, as he watered the green stuff in his glass and the drops fell one by one. Then I got to figuring who he was and wondering what he'd do, and I turned my head and there watching him was the lady that's known as Lou. His eyes went rubberin' round the room and he seemed in a kind of a daze, till at last that old piano fell in the way of his wandering gaze. The ragtime kid was having a drink, there was no one else on the stool, so the stranger stumbles across the room and flops down there like a fool. In a buckskin shirt that was glazed with dirt, he sat and I saw him sway. Then he clutched the keys with his talon hands. My God, but that man could play. Were you ever out in the great alone when the moon was awful clear and the icy mountains hemmed you in with a silence you most could hear? With only the howl of a timber wolf and you camped there in the cold, a half-dead thing in a stark dead world clean mad for the muck called gold. While high overhead, green, yellow, and red, the night north lights swept in bars, then you've a hunch what the music meant, hunger and night and the stars. And hunger not of the belly kind that's banished with bacon and beans, but the gnawing hunger of lonely men for a home and all that it means. For a fireside far from the cares that are, four walls and a roof above, but oh so cramful of cozy joy and crowned with a woman's love. A woman dearer than all the world, and true as heaven in it is true. God, how ghastly she looks through her rouge, the lady that's known as Lou. Then on, then on a sudden the music changed so soft that you scarce could hear, but you felt that your life had been looted clean of all that it once held dear, that someone had stolen the woman you loved, that her love was a devil's lie, that your guts were gone and the best for you was to crawl away and die. "'Twas the crowning cry of a heart's despair, and it thrilled you through and through. "'I guess I'll make it a spread misere," said dangerous Dan McGrew. "'The music almost died away, then it burst like a pent-up flood, "'and it seemed to say, repay, repay, and my eyes were blind with blood. "'The thought came back of an ancient wrong, and it stung like a frozen lash, "'and the lust awoke to kill, to kill, then the music stopped with a crash.' And the stranger turned, and his eyes they burned in a most peculiar way. In a buckskin shirt that was glazed with dirt, he sat and I saw him sway. Then his lips went in a, his lips went in in a kind of grin, and he spoke, and his voice was calm. And boys, says he, you don't know me, and none of you care a damn. But I want to state, and the words are straight, and I'll bet my poke they're true, uh, that one of you is a hound of hell, and that one is Dan McGrew. Then I ducked my head, and the lights went out, and two guns blazed in the dark. And a woman screamed, and the lights went up, and two men lay stiff and stark. Pitched on his head, and pumped full of lead, was dangerous Dan McGrew, while the man from the creeks lay clutched to the breast of the lady that's known as Lou. These are the simple facts of the case, and I guess I ought to know. They say that the stranger was crazed with hooch, and I'm not denying it so. I'm not so wise as the lawyer as the lawyer guys but strictly between us two the woman that kissed him and pinched his poke was the lady that's known as Lou so next up is a performance from a singer-songwriter here in Greensboro Maryland now she is only 15 years old and her name is Stevie Lyles and she's gonna perform a song called I don't want to now, she's been writing songs for about three years now, which made her, what, 12, I think, when she first started. I feel suddenly very old. Um, well, I needed to get started a lot earlier, I believe. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, she uh, started this song, I think it was the first song she attempted to write as a singer-songwriter, but it sat, I think, on a shelf for a little while because she didn't really know what the main message of it was supposed to be. Uh, somewhere along the line, she figured that out, and then all of a sudden the lyrics came right to her. So uh, she said that uh, she hopes everyone loves the song as much as she did writing it, and uh, she's going to present it for you now. This is Stevie Lyles, I Don't Want To, is the name of the song. She's 15 from Greensboro, Maryland, and please enjoy her performance. <laughs>
you can't hurt me Cause I'm too damn strong And I pity the fool Who falls in love Sisters who are actors playing men who are idiots while sort of hanging out with Hamlet. Well, near Hamlet and occasionally with Hamlet. If you think that sounds absurd, well, it is because so is the play. Well, absurdist is the play. Um, sisters Hester and Gretchen Sachs are going to be performing a scene from Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. So they have put together a brief little introduction that I think serves much better than what I'm going to say from this point forward. So I'm going to turn it over to them. Enjoy Hester and Gretchen Sachs. We're Hester and Gretchen Sachs here in Chestertown, Maryland, and we're going to be presenting a scene from Tom Stoppard's Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. In the scene, I will be playing the part of Rosencrantz, or Guildenstern. And I will be playing the part of Guildenstern, or Rosencrantz. Heads. 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 There is an art to the building up of suspense. Heads. Though it can be done by luck alone. Heads. If that's the word I'm after. 76, love. Heads. A weaker man might be moved to re-examine his faith, if in nothing else, at least in the law of probability. Heads. The law of probability, it has been oddly asserted, is something to do with the proposition that if six monkeys, if six monkeys were... Game? Were they? Are you? Game. The law of averages, if I've got this right, means that if six monkeys were thrown up in the air for long enough, they would land on their tails about as often as they would land on their heads, which even at first glance does not strike one as a particularly rewarding speculation, in either sense, even without the monkeys. I mean, you wouldn't bet on it. I mean, I would, but you wouldn't. Heads. Would you? Heads. Bore, isn't it? A bore? Well, what about the suspense? What suspense? It must be the law of diminishing returns. I feel the spell about to be broken. Well, it was an even chance, if my calculations are correct. 85 in a row, beating the record. Don't be absurd. Easily. Is that it then? Is that all? What? A new record. Is that as far as you were prepared to go? Well... No questions? Not even a pause? You spun them yourself. Not a flicker of doubt. Well, I won, didn't I? And if you'd lost, if they come down against you 85 times, one after another, just like that? 85 times in a row. Tails. Yes. What would you think? 
Well, well, I have a good look at your coins to start. I'm relieved. At least we can still count on self-interest as a predictable factor. I suppose it's the last to go. Your capacity for trust made me wonder if perhaps you alone. We have been spinning coins together since... This is not the first time we have spun coins. Oh no, we've been spinning coins for as long as I can remember. How long is that? I forget. Mind you, 85 times. Yes. It'll take some beating, I imagine. Is that what you imagine? Is that it? No fear? Fear? Fear. The crack that might flood your brain with light. Heads. I'm afraid. So am I. I'm afraid it isn't your day. I'm afraid it is. 89. It must be indicative of something besides the redistribution of wealth. List of possible explanations. One, I am willing it. Inside, where nothing shows, I am the essence of a man spinning double-headed coins and betting against himself in private atonement for an unremembered past. Heads. Two, time has stopped dead, and the single experience of one coin being spun has been repeated 90 times. On the whole, doubtful. Three, divine intervention. But four, a spectacular vindication of the principle that each individual coin spun individually is as likely to come down heads as tails and therefore should cause no surprise each individual time it does. I've never known anything like it. And a syllogism. One, he has never known anything like it. Two, he has never known anything to write home about. Three, it is nothing to write home about. Home. What's the first thing you remember? Oh, let's see. The first thing that comes to my head, you mean? But no, the first thing you remember. Ah, no good, it's gone. It was a long time ago. You don't get my meaning. What is the first thing after all the things you've forgotten? Oh, I see. I've forgotten the question. Are you happy? What? Content, at ease. I suppose so. What are you going to do now? I don't know. What do you want to do? I have no desires. None. There was a messenger. That's right. We were sent for. Syllogism, the second. One, probability is a factor which operates within natural forces. Two, probability is not operating as a factor. Three, we are now within unsub or supernatural forces. Discuss. Not too heatedly. I'm sorry, I... What's the matter with you? The scientific approach to the examination of phenomena is a defense against the pure emotion of fear. Keep tight hold and continue while there's time. The sun came up about as often as it went down in the long run, and a coin showed heads about as often as it showed tails. Then a messenger arrived. We had been sent for. Nothing else happened. 92 coins spun consecutively have come down heads 92 consecutive times, and for the last three minutes, on the wind of a windless day, I have heard the sound of drums and flute. Another curious scientific phenomenon is the fact that fingernails grow after death, as does the beard. What? Beard. But you're not dead. I didn't say they started to grow after death. The fingernails also grow before birth, though not the beard. What? Beard! What's the matter with you? The toenails, on the other hand, never grow at all. The toenails never grow at all? Do they? It's a funny thing. I cut my fingernails all the time, and every time I think to cut them, they need cutting. Now, for instance. And yet, I never, to the best of my knowledge, cut my toenails. Do you remember the first thing that happened today? I woke up, I suppose. Oh, I've got it now. That man, a foreigner, he woke us up. A messenger. That's it. Pale sky before dawn. A man standing in the saddle, about to bang the shutters, shouts, clear off. But then he called our names. You remember that. The man woke us up. Yes. We were sent for. Yes. That's why we're here. Traveling. Yes. It was urgent, a matter of extreme urgency. 
a royal summons, his very words. Official business and no questions asked, lights in the stable yard, saddle up and off headlong and hot foot, across the land, our guides outstripped at a breakneck pace, fearful lest we come too late. Too late for what? How should I know? We haven't gotten there yet. Thank you very much. So closing out our first installment of GCTV's Public Access is a performance by Annie Sparks. Now we had this really incredibly successful, fantastic production that I'm sure you all remember that uh, occurred late last year called Annie the Musical. In that show, uh, playing the role of Grace Farrell was Annie Sparks. Uh, the show was not named after her, by the way. Uh, so she has uh, been a performer for quite some time. She is relatively new to the Eastern Shore, and I understand that she's been a choreographer for something like 20 plus years. Uh, she works for the Queen Anne's County Area Agency on Aging, where she is a senior center administrator. So I want you to enjoy her performance and rendition of Memory from Cats. So here you go. This is Annie Sparks.
Well, folks, it's been our great pleasure to bring you the very first installment of GCTV Public Access. Now, we plan on doing many more of these in the future. So get out that old dusty talent and get yourself ready and sit in front of a video camera and record something amazing for us. Uh, so if you want to participate in future uh, presentations of our public access program, it all starts with a proposal, which you can send to us via our email address of GC tvpa at garfieldcenter.org. We'll send you back a response, get you going, and then hopefully you will appear on an upcoming presentation of GCTV Public Access. So on behalf of all of our performers this evening and Nick back in the studio and all of the folks at the Garfield Center for the Arts and my staff, we want to thank you for regularly tuning in to our GCTV programs. And I'm now going to send this program back to Nick for a final word. Thanks. Good night. All right. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed um, the first episode of GCTV. I sure did. Um, so uh, let's see. Next week, we have uh, Freddie Granillo. Uh, that's going to be exciting. Oh, fun. Um, <laughs> that's going to be uh, that's going to be cool. Um, and then the first week in June, I am happy to announce that Garfield or the Garfield Improv Group will be performing. Um, so that's going to be cool. I'll have more details about that coming up in uh, the next week or so. Um, so yeah. Um, so I'd like to end with another ask, you know, if you enjoyed what you saw here tonight or any other night, uh, we ask that you please consider donating or buying a gift certificate from the Garfield Center um, by visiting garfieldcenter.org slash donate slash. Um, so that's it. I hope you guys had fun. I had fun. Um, and I'll see you next time. Bum, bum, bum.